What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anzalone. On today's show, I'm breaking down the U.S. and Iranian negotiations to try to save the nuclear deal, what's happening with U.S. troops in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, and then I'm going to be discussing Israel's war against Ben and Jerry's. So a lot of interesting stuff to talk about in today's show. Be sure you share the show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute, libertarianinstitute.org slash Kyle for a full archive of the show. We post the video version of the show on YouTube, Odyssey, and Rumble. We have social media accounts where we post the show and clips from the show at Twitter, Facebook, and MeWe. The Twitter account is at con underscore interest. You could donate to the show at Patreon or Subscribestar, or you could help the show and get yourself some great high quality CBD products by doing your CBD shopping at Paloma Verde. The reason you go to Paloma Verde is because they have high quality products with the lab tester results right there on their website. They also have a wide variety of products and they combine their CBD with things like melatonin and curcumin uh, to make the effect that you need, whether it's, you know, uh, falling asleep at night or pain relief uh, more substantial. So they have a great lineup of products. I really like their topicals. I use their sports cream most days. Uh, so whatever uh, you got going on, you probably find something to help you at Paloma Verde. The URL is PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Again, PalomaVerdeCBD.com. And when you check out, you use the promo code PEACE, P-E-A-C-E, and that saves you 25% off when you spend $75 or more, and it gets the show a kickback. All right, let's get into the show today. First thing I'm talking about is the U.S. dropping more bombs on Afghanistan. Uh, this picked up pretty soon after the command for the war switched over from uh, General Austin Scott Miller, who was at the Bagram Air Base when that closed. It switched over to CENTCOM, and that is General Kenneth McKenzie. And the U.S. again has picked up the number of airstrikes it is carrying out against the Taliban in support of the Afghan government. Now, the U.S. throughout this whole process has always maintained that it's going to have a over-the-horizon capability is what they call it. But basically, it just means the ability to bomb or carry out raids in Afghanistan and they're going to maintain this either from their bases in the Gulf they're trying to get bases in Central Asia uh, I, I think they would like ideally the Pakistanis to let them have some kind of base but Pakistan's already said no so they're kind of in a bind on how the, they're carrying this out but at least they're able to carry out airstrikes at this point with this over the horizon capability and again they've always talked about having this although for the most part, they've said it in relation to the war on terrorism, that we're not going to let al-Qaeda uh, rise in Afghanistan if we find al-Qaeda. Rumors of al-Qaeda, we're going to take them out. The jihadist types, the people who want to wage international terrorism against the United States. However, that isn't the Taliban, and so carrying out these airstrikes seems to already be in a shift uh, from the policy that Joe Biden laid out in his speech. Now, McKenzie made it clear that the, these strikes will not end, or he won't say if they will end, on August 31st when Biden said the military mission in Afghanistan will end. Now, maybe he thinks this is like a tactical thing, and they're actually, uh, there's a strict cutoff date for the Pentagon of the 31st to carry out strikes against the Taliban, uh, the 31st of August, that is, and maybe they're rushing to carry them out now for that reason, seeing they only have a month to do this. Uh, but it is concerning that they're picking up the number of airstrikes and he's unwilling to commit uh, and tell the American people that, hey, the military ending, mission ending on August 31st really does mean the mission against the Taliban. And that includes bombing them uh, as Biden, you know, made the point he made in his speech, which I don't think is necessarily correct, that the U.S. has built the Afghans a military. But the point that he made was that it would be on the Afghan military at that point. Now, it may be incapable because the U.S. built them in a capable military and uh, tried to force a government on the people of Afghanistan that wasn't going to work. 
But all, all that being said, that was, you know, the position Biden made clear in his statement. And now it seems that McKenzie is at least second guessing that, uh, if not outright saying that, you know, we're, we're going to blow past that deadline. Now, it, it has been as many as a, a dozen strikes, apparently. So this isn't insignificant. Um, it, you know, maybe the, these are turning back offensive against uh, district centers, which the U.S. government now admits that the Taliban controlled nearly half or more than half of in the country. Country and uh, maybe trying to slow kind of the progress and the gains of the Taliban. One thing I want to talk about in the coverage of this is everybody, the, the mainstream media seems to like to make this point that the offensive in Afghanistan is increasing as the U.S. announced we were withdrawing. And this leaves out a lot of context to the situation. The offensive in Afghanistan by the Taliban was on pause really since, like, I think halfway through 2019, but definitely starting in February 2020 when the Doha Accords were signed, uh, the, you know, the what Trump called a peace agreement, it really wasn't, but an agreement between the U.S. and the Taliban where the U.S. would eventually leave Afghanistan. And I think the Taliban, you know, weren't supposed to just go out and, you know, slaughter the, the Afghan people. And during that time, and you know, since uh, well over a year now, no American soldiers have died in Afghanistan. And, and so the the Taliban offensive has been put on pause because the U.S. said that we would have our troops out of Afghanistan by May 1st. Now, you have another phenomenon in Afghanistan where the country essentially has a fighting season. People fight less during the winter months than once it starts to warm up. Uh, it uptits. And so the announcement of the U.S. withdrawal coincided with that. And so with the fact that Biden had blown past Trump's deadline and while the Taliban had said that you know Biden was extending the agreement at the same time you know the Taliban were like it's now our fighting season and so we're you know going to war against the Afghan government as we had in the Afghan war government is against at war against the Taliban so is the United States and we were carrying out airstrikes against them and, and so it, I think it's just misleading and I want to point that out because I I know this is, it, I see it in so many of like the Reuters the AP style articles I'm reading where they're just kind of saying that oh Oh, the offensive is happening because the U.S. announced their withdrawal. Now, that may be in part why the Taliban is picking up so much ground, as the, I think the Afghan government is reassessing their strategy a little bit at this point, and they're defending less territory because you know they they have less support from the U.S. I mean. You know, this is the world empire military machine. So we are going to have less of that support than you could probably defend less than you would before. Uh, as I've always talked about with Afghanistan, once the U.S. leaves, there's going to be, uh, you know, it's very bloody, th this analogy, but it is like a market style correction that's going to happen. Uh, there are people that are in power in certain places who would not be in power in that place if it wasn't for Americans occupying Afghanistan. So when the U.S. leaves, whenever that is, that's going to change. And so there is, I think, some of that going on, and that is accelerating because of the withdrawal. But they do leave out the whole context of Trump's deal, the slowdown in fighting over the past year, and uh, the, the Afghan fighting season. Uh, a couple other interesting stories on Afghanistan. NATO affirms its support and continued funding for Afghan government, writes Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com. He says the U.S. and NATO will give the Afghan government, or Afghan military, excuse me, $4 billion each year, at least until 2024 unknown after that. Now, when we say $4 billion from NATO and the U.S., there, there's really not a balance there or anything like that. The U.S. this year is going to give $3.3 .3 billion. And so it almost uh, like waters down how much the U.S. ends up giving uh, here when you say the U.S. and NATO. But $4 billion total is a ton of money. Now, while they're committing to doing this through 2024, who knows that the Afghan military is going to, you know, control a substantial amount of the Afghanistan for that long. And so I think it's very possible that 
this ends up changing but that's what they're pledging at this point uh it's an important sign to americans that our government is going to continue to take billions of our tax dollars and give them to afghanistan and to the extent that there may be some cause you know the u.s has caused a ton of damage in that country we've empowered warlords port uh weapons in and given them to the some of the worst people on the absolute planet not just in afghanistan but just some of the most repulsive figures who have like the worst ideas and uh, engage in ruthless and uh, you know the the sexual exploitation of young boys and stuff like that um the the fact that we propped up all those people maybe there is you know some humanitarian aid the u.s could give afghanistan spending money on facilitating you know getting refugees out of the country or you know putting them somewhere where they're going to be safe but you know not to just dump the money into this military that is already hemorrhaging we had an interesting statement from our uh, Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. He said that Afghanistan would turn into a pariah state if the Taliban takes over the country by force. Now, I think there's, there's some interesting parts about this statement that I want to break down. The, the first is that... I don't know why he, he thinks this is the case. Uh, as I'm going to talk about uh, in the coming stories here, China and Pakistan are both dealing with the Taliban, which are two of Afghanistan's most significant neighbors. And so that the idea that Afghanistan is going to become a pariah state, I don't know if the, how much the Taliban are really going to care about UN recognition. I mean, it's going to be worse if the Taliban take over because the US is going to sanction the hell out of the country then. Uh, but at, at the same time i don't think you know the taliban legitimacy or you know becoming a prior state can necessarily be determined just by the u.s alone and that there, i think there's plenty of states in the region that are going to work with the taliban whether they take over by force or not russia iran china uh pakistan uh with you know probably the most significant of those countries being the pakistan a very strong u.s ally uh, the other, I guess, issue I have here with, with uh, Blinken's statement is he says there's only one path, and that's at the negotiating table to resolve uh, the conflict peace, uh, the conflict peacefully. And the problem is that there's really not just one path for the Taliban. The Taliban have a lot of options at this point, and that's because uh, the, the strong posture, uh, you know, force in the country is the Taliban, and. It looks like they have the military ability to take over that country, or at least significant portions of it. It seems like at this point, you know, they're not taking some major cities just because they know they'll get bombed by the U.S., but if that threat ever leaves, they'll take over more. And so I don't think the Taliban are just limited to that one uh, path forward. And Blinken is just saying it because he wants to create this narrative that if the Taliban won't pursue this one path, then, you know, the U.S. has to bomb them. Um, talking about uh, the Taliban uh, associating with neighboring states, Chal uh, China received a Taliban designation and said the Taliban will play an important role in the future of Afghan reconstruction. Uh, I'm sure for people who are going to uh, countries that are going to invest money in building infrastructure in Afghanistan, uh, while you know maybe not a massive border uh, for people who are watching the show here, could see that this little like. A uh, stretch of land from Afghanistan that cuts between Turkmenistan and Pakistan actually does share a border with China, and that is the uh, Uyghur area of China, the Xinjiang province that uh, the U.S. criticizes China for human rights violations there, right? And so, you know, with that in China, you know, having this massive Belt and Road Initiative, uh, this probably signals to me that China is saying that, hey, we're willing to invest in Afghanistan, even if the, the Taliban continue to rise to power. Now, the, the Chinese said that, and they also made a request from the Taliban, and that was for the Taliban to sever ties with the East Turkmenistan Islamic movement. And this is uh, the Uyghur, the Uyghur Muslim 
group that Be- Beijing accuses of being behind uh, terrorist attacks in the Xinjiang province. Uh, previously, the U.S. had labeled this group as a terrorist organization. In fact, in 2018, the U.S. bombed, this is under Trump, bombed this group in Afghanistan, although this group was taken off the terrorist list uh, by the Trump administration eventually. Uh, something that I've talked about in the past on the show too is we know there's a large number, thousands of Uyghur fighters who did travel to uh, Syria to fight on the side of the jihadists, whether that be the Al Qaeda, uh, Al Nusra, uh, HTS types, or the Islamic State fighters in that country. Pakistan uh, is shown willingness to talk with the Taliban. Obviously, there's some long standing ties there. Uh, but after Afghan Soldiers fled over the border into Pakistan, and the uh, Taliban uh, took another border crossing, this time with Pakistan. That border crossing was reopened. And so these border crossings reopening uh, suggests to me that, to some extent, Pakistan, you know, going to work, going to recognize uh, the Taliban, and, it, you know, is going to allow commerce to cross over that border. I think after it was taken, like 100 trucks crossed over that net, the next day. Uh, the, these are the kind of things that is going to allow the Taliban to get even uh, probably more tariffs and tads and stuff like that and even more legitimately be the governing force of Afghanistan and so no matter what Blinken says uh, you know trying to call and label Afghanistan a pariah state it is I think that the Taliban would be a state that would be accepted by most of its neighbors and that's something the U.S. I, I guess will have to reckon with when we talk about our foreign policy for Afghanistan moving forward. The U.S. says it's deeply troubled by Taliban attacks on civilians, and this seems to me to be the, you know, kind of war state uh, actors in the Biden administration doing everything they can to try to drum up cause and demands for the U.S. not to leave that country. Uh, Again, you know, this with the uh, current bombing campaign going on and this increased rhetoric, while the U.S. is down to apparently sit under something troops there at the embassy, and this is a you know a significant drawdown. We gave up the Bagram Air Base at least at this point. The idea that the U.S. has completely ended this war and it's a foregone conclusion that this war is over it is not yet there. And you know maybe this is the last gaps of the war state trying to save this war. At the same time, it may be uh, what the the war state actually needs to keep a, a more significant U.S. presence in that country. I don't think the the Biden the track is set for the, the the path the Biden administration is on, and that they're going to continue to try to increase the amount of intervention intervention we have in Afghanistan going forward. Now, it's interesting, you know, the U.S. is constantly condemning the Taliban for human rights abuses, which they commit plenty of. No, not contesting that the Taliban are not, you know, some heroic, you know, fighting force. Um, You know, they're they're not exactly the, uh, you know, maybe maybe the founding fathers had some more uh, dark aspects of them than, than are portrayed in public schools. But, you know, we have a certain glorified image of the founding fathers. The Taliban are definitely not them. At the same time, the Afghan government is certainly committing their fair share of human rights abuses, recently arresting four journalists and charging them on propaganda charges for trying to get into an area uh, that there was uh, a contest in between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Uh, This is, you know, a clear human rights violation is something you shouldn't be doing to journalists and yet the afghan government is carrying that out all right now let's get into the big uh, bulk of the the show i got lined up for today and that is to talk about uh the negotiations between the u.s and iran to save the jcpoa it's the joint comprehensive plan of action uh, it's also called the iran nuclear deal the p5 plus one agreement because the signatories to the deal were the u.n security council u.s uk france russia china and then germany as representing the un was also a signatory and then iran and so those seven countries initially uh, put together this agreement all set up uh, 2015 under the obama administration 
it, you know, Obama faced a, a tough contest on this. He really, I, I think, had to do a lot of like political work to get the Democrats, uh, you know, not to go along with the Republicans and sabotaging this deal. Uh, however, you know, it takes place. It repeals some of the, not all the sanctions, but some of the sanctions against Iran. And Iran makes a whole bunch of alterations to their nuclear program. They switch off a bunch of centrifuges. They agree to only use a certain kind and quality of centrifuge. Um, the um, the one of the, uh, poured concrete into their A-Rock and then converted their A-Rock reactor. That was something the United States had built for them. Uh, they stopped uh, enriching uranium up to percentages that were being used to form medical isotopes in their research reactor. And so there were a lot of things going on here that were that was curbing Iran's civilian nuclear program. Not that they were working to make a bomb, but Iran was curbing their civilian nuclear program so that the quote unquote breakout time like let's say tomorrow Iran decided we're going to do everything they can to get a nuclear bomb it would take a year to do so and you know the, those were like some of the results of the Iran nuclear deal now of course everybody at the time complained about the deal for a whole bunch of stupid reasons Trump liked to talk about the money the U.S. gave to Iran we are honoring a, a court ruling we had uh a, taken money in advance to purchase uh an air force for Iran, some, I believe like more F four Tomcats and stuff like that. And then the Iranian revolution happened. So we weren't going to give those weapons to the Ayatollah, but we kept the money they made advance payments for. And so, you know, that money was given back to the Iranians, but now let's look at what happened under the Trump administration, where Trump started to put more sanctions on Iran, which is, was, you know, a real violation of the, of the spirit of the Iran nuclear deal. And then ultimately just tore the things to destroy dreads and removed uh, removed the u.s from the deal in may of 2018 and start to reimpose sanctions on iran now when that happened biden made a lot of good points actually he uh this uh from the hill saying that biden slams trump over pulling out of iran deal it took years to achieve it says former vice president joe biden slammed president trump on tuesday for his decision to withdraw the u.s from the iran nuclear accord saying it took years to form the agreement and that no next step is apparent biden suggested the trump administration would be hard pressed to uh, more efficiently curtail Iran's nuclear ambitions. He says, talk of a better deal is an illusion. It took years of sanctions, pressure, painstaking diplomacy, and the full support of the international community to our achieve, our, achieve our goal. We have none of that in place today. And so uh, I want to break down this part by a statement because I think it's like really revealing. I think in some ways it's an accurate critique of the Trump uh, policy, but then when he goes and becomes president, we see like the the maybe the little flaws that start in his statement that end up being why he doesn't actually save the Iran nuclear deal, and so he's he does make the good point here that uh, there's not a better deal to be achieved now the the fundamental problems of his statement are a he believes Iran wants to make a nuclear bomb and this deal prevents it from happening. Two, that sanctions were key to gain the original nuclear deal in place and that, you know, sanctions pressure is effective in negotiations. And also, uh, I think another problem we see here uh, with, with Biden's thing is, is he's saying we don't have that in place today, but not necessarily that that couldn't be in place in the future. And so, you know, he's looking and saying that today Trump can't get a better deal, but he's not necessarily saying that another president could have. And I think we'll see that come about. But at the time, it was a huge mistake on the Trump uh, part. While, you know, the U.S. was in a position with Iran where, uh, you know, after 2015, we really could ramp down tensions that could allow the U.S. to withdraw from Iraq, get our troops out of Syria, really scale back in the Middle East, take the Iran boogeyman off the table. But instead, Trump withdraws from the deal and uh, completely reverses everything. Another intuitive thing that Biden said is that uh, it will likely put uh, you know, uh, I think Iran back on a collision course with the U.S. Now, he says it would likely uh, accomplish putting around the path to get a nuclear weapon, which it, it isn't necessarily the case, but he does kind of make both points there. Now, when we get to June of our January 2020, 
uh, candidate Biden writes an op-ed in CNN. Now, the, the date on this is important because the main thing he's talking about here isn't the Iran nuclear deal. It's about the Soleimani assassination, the U.S. tensions with Iran. However, he says in the second paragraph, but make no mistake, the seeds of this crisis were planted by Trump himself on May 8th, 2018, the day he tore up the Iran nuclear deal against the advice of his own top national security advisor, turned his back on our closest European allies and decided it was more important to, to him to destroy progress made by the Obama-Biden administration than build on it to create a better and safer world. He says the deal... Uh, the, the Iran deal verifiably cut off every one of Iran's pathways to a nuclear weapon. International inspections regularly, repeatedly confirmed Iran's compliance, as did our intelligence agencies. One of the greatest threats to stability in the region and global security, a nuclear-armed Iran, was greatly reduced. Now, again, he's wrong about the, the big, giant threat of Iran getting a nuclear weapon, but he is right about it this if there was some fictitious world where Iran was trying to secretly get a nuclear weapon, this deal would have stopped it. And the global watchdog and our own intelligence agencies did repeatedly confirm that Iran was following that agreement. So the U.S. had no reason uh, to get out of it. Uh, at the end of this article, he calls on Trump to rejoin the JCPOA. He says if Iran will comply with it as well. And so basically he's saying that if both countries get back into it, that that's the path forward that Trump should take at this point. I mean, at that sounded like a, a pretty decent offer and something it, it sounded like that Biden could easily go through on. Obviously, he could spin this as bad, stupid, racist Trump just hated the great black Obama. And that's why he got out of this deal. And so now I'm getting us back into the deal. Yay, I'm the great returning America to normalcy president. I, I, I honestly can't believe we haven't heard that speech from Biden. And uh, yeah, as we'll get into his administration's position has been uh, very far from it but you know that kind of seemed to be his take on it as a candidate was that Trump made a real blunder here uh, but you know this reverses as he becomes president another statement I'll note is after he is president elect we have Antony Blinken who at the time was serving as an advisor not uh, secretary of state as he is today but saying that if Iran comes back into compliance with the deal then yes Joe Biden said he would do the same thing, but we would use that platform to try to build a stronger, longer a deal working with our partners. And so while the, you know, now we start to really hear the stronger and longer and, and we want to build on that. Now, in a way that this is kind of sensible diplomacy, we're going to take the first step of returning to the Iran nuclear deal. And then we're going to try to make more deals with Iran. There's you know, even after the Obama administration, there were other sanctions on Iran that had nothing to do with the JCPOA. And so there, there was, I, I think, you know, reasons maybe for the U S and Iran to carry on additional negotiations. And so just depending on what the, the frame you read that in, like we want to start with easy diplomacy and build to more difficult diplomacy versus we're going to demand war right up front. Now, once he became president, it starts to get quite a bit more clear the day, uh, either the inauguration day or the day after we had White House Press Secretary Jen, uh, Jen Psaki saying, well, the president has made it clear that though on diplomacy, the United States should see to lengthen and strengthen nuclear constraints on Iran and address other issues of concern. And, and so this seems like it's more shifting to uh, Iran needs to get under compliance with the nuclear deal. Uh, but then we, we need to you know lengthen and strengthen that before sanctions are removed. And it starts to become clear that the Biden administration uh, maybe, you know, let, I'll go ahead and say, like, I think what happened was the Biden administration, when they came into office, Biden looked and said, huh, right now we have some support from our European allies because, you know, I'm coming into office and so they're all going to love the U.S. again. Uh, there have been increasing sanctions on Iran for a long time. The country is in a terrible position with the coronavirus. And so we think we have a situation where we could 
take the sanctions and use those to put more pressure on Iran to elicit more uh, concessions from the uh, Iranian government rather than just returning to the deal. In the first week of the Biden administration, we had the U.S. flying B-52 bombers uh, to the Middle East. It was for the third time in January. It was the first time under the Biden administration. And I th I'm sure Iran, you know, they see this where you have diplomacy or military and the U.S. is sending uh, military uh, B-52 bombers to the Middle East. That seems to be, uh, you know, I'm sure to the Iranians suggesting that the U.S. is definitely more interested in the military than the diplomacy track. Also, early in the administration, we had some pretty crazy statements, uh, including this one from Blinken, which may have been careless, but at the same time was very concerning, saying the U.S., uh, Blinken warns Iran weeks away from gaining a nuclear bomb. Now, I think kind of the point he was trying to make is that, you know, if Iran took all the nuclear material it had and used all that nuclear, they knew exactly what they were doing, that they could take that in two weeks, they would have enough nuclear material to make a bomb. Now, that's nowhere near the same thing as saying that Iran is two weeks away from a nuclear bomb, but that's the way that Blinken phrased it. And, and so that was, you know, seemed to be a very hawkish statement and, and the kind of thing that undermines the, the Iran nuclear deal. The U.S. quickly uh, made it clear that uh, this is one right after Secretary of State Antony Blinken, I think this is February 1st, uh, said that Iran has to return to the agreement first, and the U.S. dismissed Iranian offers uh, for a re uh, coordinated return to the deal. And so you do have a complicated situation here where over the course of the Trump administration, Iran, after the U.S. left the deal and reapplied sanctions and European partners were unable to get around the U.S. sanctions. And so it wasn't as if it was just the U.S. that had left the deal. It was essentially Iran wasn't gaining any of the economic benefit from the U.S. or any of our allies France, Germany, the UK, anyone else in Europe because of all the, the sanctions that the U.S. had put on. And so Iran started to you know move back from their commitments to the nuclear deal. There were other issues like Iran, the U.S. sanctioned Iran from exporting uh, enriched uranium. And so it made it that Iran had to violate, or not maybe had to, but ended up violating the cap on the amount of enriched uranium they were supposed to have merely by continuing to produce, uh, you know, enriched uranium by running their nuclear reactors, right? But they also did things like upgrade their nuclear centrifuges, run more nuclear centrifuges. They were taking up the amount of uh, enrichment they were doing on the, the nuclear fuel to like 3.6, like 5% at this point. So there were several places where uh, Iran was now, quote unquote, out of compliance with the deal as it, it, the U.S. had been in it. Now, as a part of the official JCPOA written letter of the agreement, it did say there, it laid out very specifically that if any of the parties left the agreement, then Iran could take steps away from the agreement as well. And so, you know, now there's a position where maybe Iran shuts off 100 nuclear react, uh, nuclear centrifuges, and in exchange, the U.S. lifts sanctions on the oil uh, on Iran's oil sector. Like this kind of thing, I think could happen very quickly, and maybe there would need to be some kind of talks for this to happen. Uh, and, and maybe this would have been a more practical step forward than the U.S. just returning to the deal right away. But at the same time, the U.S. said immediately they're, they're in no way interested in doing this. And so, uh, again, you know, th this is prime time for Biden to just say we're undoing the mistakes of the uh, Trump administration. We're doing everything we can to get back into the deal. We're talking with the Iranians. We're easing a few sanctions just in good faith. We're sending them some masks. They have a hard time with the COVID, but no, they, they keep up the sanctions at this point and they essentially refuse to negotiate and says Iran must return to the deal first, even though it was the U.S. that broke the deal first. Then, problematic, Biden made a statement that ends up being walked back by the Biden administration, but th this is just crazy. Biden said that the U.S. wouldn't lift sanctions on Iran until Iran halted uranium enrichment, which is something that even the Iran nuclear deal that 
you know, Obama negotiated, Obama uh, Biden approved of and said the U.S. should return to allows. And so it either showed uh, Biden was really out of the loop on the JCPOA, maybe being misled. Maybe this is kind of the old, old man Biden having a brain fart kind of situation. Um, but either way, you know, this sends signals to Iran that the U.S. is looking at more hostile positions. At this time, the U.S. also sold a seized shipment of Iranian fuel. So uh, under the Trump administration, we oppose all these new sanctions. Then we claim Iran is viol violating the sanctions. And then we start sealing some Iranian cargo ships and taking the fuel on them. Now, the Biden administration could come in, say this is inappropriate international behavior. My predecessor didn't follow the, the international rules based order and easily just, you know, send this ship back on its way. Say you don't even have to say sorry for the inconvenience. Don't even have to like repay them for their time or anything. You just don't go ahead and sell the oil and keep the money or even sell the oil and get the money back out. There, there's other ways around this too. But instead, the Biden administration moves ahead, ends up uh, selling this oil. And uh, of course, it, you know, if you're the Iranians and you see this, I'm sure you're like, uh, d does this side, is, is it a good faith negotiator in any sense at all? The U.S. also said uh, in February that it would enter into talks with Iran, but that regional issues must also be on the table. So we'll have talks with Iran to get back into the nuclear deal, but we also want to talk to Iran uh, about their support for Hezbollah and Assad and the Shia militants in, in Iraq and uh, the Houthis in Yemen and all these other things the U.S. accuses the Iranians of doing. Some of it's true, some of it not, and, you know, some of it they exaggerate, some of it's, you know, just a little bit more tame than they say. But, you know, this wasn't originally a part of the nuclear deal that the United States left. And maybe this is a good point to stop and say that this really wrecked the Iranian economy, not just because the U.S. moved back with these high dollar or with these massive, the U.S. called it a maximum, maximum pressure campaign sanctions on Iran, but also because, you know, the Iranian economy just a couple of years earlier starts to open up to the West. I'm sure, you know, people are starting to invest cop capital, making all these time and business commitments into being able to either import things from European companies or, you know, produce things in Iran that you could then sell to European companies. You're setting up distribution networks. All these things cost a lot of money. They're really complicated to do. It, it, it's a shift in the Iranian economy to be open back up to the world. And so for the U.S. to, you know, go into the agreement and then a couple of years later back right out of it, I think really added some extra uh, downforce on the Iranian economy. And so for the U.S. to not even be good enough to say, let's just negotiate on how to return to the nuclear deal, leave everything else aside, was probably a, a pretty easy non-starter for the Iranians because after they've already been punished so much for negotiating with the United States, why would they agree uh, on the start to additional concessions. At this same time, we had uh, a, a thing going on within Iran where because of the assassination of the Iranian nuclear scientist uh, Fokanzadi in January, it was at the end of the Trump administration, wasn't yet into the Biden administration. Uh, this was uh, pretty clearly carried out, uh, at least in part by Israel and Iran. Maybe the U.S. had a hand. Maybe we just knew about it. Either way, as a result of that, uh, feeling like they're, you know, under attack in their own country with their scientists being assassinated, the Iranian government passed uh, some kind of new ordinance that said that they were going to take steps, uh, more steps back from their cooperation with the JCPOA. Uh, and this included some of the additional and SNAP inspections that the IAEA, uh, the International Atomic, Atomic Energy Agency, this is the UN's nuclear watchdog, that they were going to roll these back. Now, Iran, even though they're, they're government had passed this ended up negotiating with the iaea 
to continue all the data collection, but just not pass it on to the IAEA as long as the U.S. re-entered the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, within three months. Iran actually ends up extending this a couple of times before it ends up expiring. Uh, but this is, you know, just goes to show that even throughout this, Iran is like willing to negotiate with these, you know, third parties, the IAEA, and try to carry things out in, in essentially good faith, only to have the U.S continue to be an unwilling negotiating partner around the same time february 22nd blinken u.s wants to strengthen iran nuclear deal dave decamp at antiwar.com uh he writes secretary of state antony blinken said monday that the u.s will work to lengthen and strengthen the iran nuclear deal known as the jcpoa president biden has said if iran comes back into strict compliance with the united states the u.s will do the same uh, we will sink to lengthen and strengthen the JCPOA to address our other areas of concern about Iran's destabilizing regional behavior and missile ballistic missile development and proliferation. So, uh, again, we, we continue to have these statements from the Biden administration that, you know, we're only willing to get back into the deal if Iran gets into strict compliance with it first, and then they're willing to negotiate on extending, you know, the, the parts of the deal that restrict Iran's uh, civilian nuclear energy and medical programs. Then we have a statement from Wendy Sherman, who is was at the time the deputy nominee for deputy secretary of state. She has since been confirmed to the position. Uh, recently, she was in China. But here, as she's a nominee, she's saying that even if the U.S. returns to the JCPOA, hundreds of sanctions will remain on Iran. And so if you're the Iranians, you have to hear this statement. And after this lady thinks, gets confirmed and think that, well, it doesn't seem like the U.S. is really even looking would return to the nuclear deal. If we did, they're just going to take some steps back towards it, but keep on more sanctions. Then we have this character, Richard Nephew. He gets appointed as the deputy Iran envoy. I guess first I should mention uh, Biden's Iran envoy is Robert Mali, who was key to negotiating the Iran nuclear deal. And when I heard that he was going to be the Iran envoy, I was somewhat optimistic that the U.S. and, and Biden actually were plan to return back to it because it seems like if you want uh, to get back into the agreement, one of the things that you could do is you could appoint Robert Molly to the position to, you know, help help uh, make that process happen. His relationship with Zaif, he helped negotiate this before. Uh, but then he makes his deputy, Richard Nephew, who is the sadistic sanctions monster. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, The Art of uh, I think the art of sanctions, actually, I think uh, Matt's changed the title in his uh, thumbnail there. And in his book, The Art of Sanctions, uh, he describes that, you know, he was disappointed when he went to Russia and saw the price of chicken uh, wasn't high enough and food was plentiful. And he was happy when Iranians had to pay more for food around the holiday and talked about how the intentional, the, the, Biden or the Obama sanctions on Iran were targeted to make the poor people in the country poor and the rich people in the country richer to exacerbate the, the social issues in the country and I guess hopefully make the people so poor that everybody will eventually rise up and you know overthrow the government however that part of the policy never actually ends up happening you're just a terrible monster who made a whole bunch of children go hungry during the holidays and you know other children go hungry all the year uh you know the uh, now with the u.s sanctions on iran that the biden administration has continued you know there, there's probably people in the country uh who are more susceptible uh, succumbing to covid19 uh, a country that's had a terrible outbreak of that virus because they're less able to affect it because of the economic devastation because of the sanctions but also because the u.s labels some medical items dual use and because they're dual use they're sanctioned and not allowed to enter that country and so appointing Richard Nephew was a big red flag that the Biden administration's path wasn't going to be towards re-entering the JCPOA and just trying to return to the deal that Obama negotiated, negotiated but rather the goal of the Biden administration was going to be to exact additional concessions out of the uh, Iranian government in exchange for the U.S. returning to a deal that it broke. 
uh, March 8th, 2021, we have Biden extending a 1995 emergency executive order that sanctions Iran. It is executive order 12957 uh, that has been renewed periodically. It was set to expire a week uh, after Biden ends up renewing it. So he renewed it. I'm not sure exactly how long he renews it for, uh, but it sanctions Iran's oil sector uh, and labels Iran a national security threat to the United States. Now, this is clearly an executive abuse of power. You have an executive order that wages economic warfare. It's a, you know really a military action on Iran, and yet it's only been approved through executive fiat since 1995. If Congress wants to endorse this, they could pass it into law. If they don't, this should just be gotten rid of. You can't have executive orders for 25 years dictating foreign policy. The Biden administration also announced new sanctions on Iranians, and so this is going in completely the other direction. At this point in the Biden administration, he has followed more the path of the Trump administration than the path of the uh, Obama administration, the path that he said he would be going down on. Uh, Secretary of State Andy Blinken said in a statement that the U.S. was blacklisting two interrogators from the IRGC on human rights violations. We also had on March 10th, uh, Robert Malley, who again, before this, I, I was like, oh, you know, maybe this is the guy that will lead the Biden administration back to the nuclear deal. But he made a statement that sounded very misinformed when he said that the administration was in no rush to revive the nuclear deal before the upcoming, then upcoming Iranian presidential elections. They happened in June. Now, at that time, you had the Iranian president Rouhani, who had negotiated the deal. The JCPOA was central to what he did and he was known as a moderate in Iran. And so for a moderate to get elected now, because Rouhani wasn't eligible to run, uh, getting back in the agreement would be something that would bolster the moderate's case that, look, there are people in the United States we could work with. Uh, rather, if we drag our feet and don't get back into the deal ever after the election, it's going to bolster the hardliners position because they're going to say, look how foolish the moderates look. Our country is suffering. And, you know, we gave up things up front when we got into the Iran nuclear deal. And now we're in a worse position than ever before. And so Molly saying, eh, we're not concerned about getting back to the deal before the June elections uh, signaled to me that, that, you know, Molly was a real problem here, too. The U.S. and Iran in the beginning of April did finally agree to have indirect talks in Vienna. The indirect portion of this talks was a precondition, I think, of the Iranians. Uh, they didn't want to do face-to-face -face discussions because, you know, they had initially said and claimed that, look, the U.S. unilaterally left this deal. The, U the U.S. should unilaterally re-enter the deal no discussions about it or anything like that that's not the way this works when you broke the deal you return to the deal then we'll get ourselves back into compliance with it but they do end up agreeing to enter at Tots in vienna uh since april we've had seven round of tots no deal has come out of it uh some progress uh seems to have been made uh, but at the same time you know nothing conclusive has come out of it but again you know this is april we're talking about here Three days after the uh, um, TOTS, well, uh, TOTS are announced, we uh, have uh, Israel informed the U.S. that intact in Iran's uh, Savi's ship in the Red Sea on Tuesday, April 6th. It claims it was to retaliate against Iranian regressions, but the timing of it seems to really suggest that the idea was to sabotage the TOTS in Vienna, either by getting Iran to react against Israel, which then uh, HOTS in the U.S. could leverage against the Biden administration to keep them from entering into TOTS with Iran, or um, you know, maybe even gain into some bigger conflict with Iran if Iran were to retaliate and hit like a, American targets or something like that. We have statements from Biden at the beginning of the talks after the first round of talks with the Biden administration clearly saying that they're not even willing to lift all the Trump era sanctions. This is this is pretty key to me. This is where I start to really doubt if we're going to get back into this deal. Uh, I thought that maybe the Biden would do it just because it was such an easy 
a victory to have blame everything on Trump. Your return to the policies of Obama is going to ramp down tensions in the Middle East. COVID is going on. You could say it's going to help the Iranians with COVID and that's how there, there's so many good arguments for it. But instead, they're saying that they're not willing to lift the sanctions. And it seems that some of the sanctions that they're unwilling to lift are about the IRGC, uh, one of Iran's military branches. Then there was an attack on an Iranian nuclear facility on April 11th. Uh, this was likely carried out by Israel. Iran referred to it as nuclear terrorism, although they say they foiled most of the attacks, so it wasn't very successful. Uh, we have more statements from the Biden administration uh, in late April saying that uh, the U.S. was open to lifting some terror sanctions, but was going to keep sanctions on the IRGC. The sanctions on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Fighting Corps are Trump era sanctions. And so these are sanctions that I think would have to be uh, lifted in order to get Iran to return back to the deal. We then had an Iranian fuel tanker attacked off the coast of Syria with three Iranians being killed. This came after Israel admitted to attacking almost a dozen Iranian ships uh, in the region since I believe it, it was late 2019. So from that point until April 2021, those 18 months, Israel carrying out about 13 sabotage attacks on Iranian ships. Then we have the U.S. sending ships into the Persian Gulf and these ships getting into uh, skirmishes, not like shooting or anything, but the Iranian small uh, vessels are uh, traveling within, you know, the U.S. will say 100 feet or 100 yards or something of these larger uh, net. Uh, Coast Guard vessels that apparently were lost and confused that the Gulf of Mexico wasn't the Persian Gulf. And so, you know, all these actions by the Obama, uh, by the Biden administration are saying that we have a hostile policy against the Iranians and at the same time are pretending that, you know, it's the Iranians fault that negotiate uh, that the negotiations in Vienna aren't going better, that the deal isn't getting done yet. The U.S. also carried out massive war games uh, in the Middle East targeting Iran at the beginning of June. They were called the Falcon Strike 21 Aerial War Games. Uh, Israel deployed uh, sits F-35s for it. The U.S. deployed F-35s. Britain deployed F-35s. Italy was involved. And again, you know, if you're Iran, uh, a country that, you know, doesn't have a massive you know, military, their, their military budget is fractions of what the U.S. is. I'm sure they have some air defense, but look, if the U.S. is flying a massive amount of air force in the region, you know, this is a real threat to the Iranians. And at a time, the U.S. is also pretending to be involved in negotiations with Iran and Vienna. Uh, seems like real double dealing. We have more statements this time from Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying that hundreds of sanctions on Iran will remain, including Trump era measures, if even if the U.S. returns to the JCPOA. So it's really not even the U.S. returning to the compliance with the agreement. Throughout the negotiations, we've had various times where Iran would say we're close to an agreement. We think things are moving well. Uh, we've had statements from the Russian delegation, including Sergei Lavrov, saying that we're moving in close to signing an agreement. And every time that happened, and this is just one example that Dave DeCamp has written up here from the middle of June at antiwar.com, the U.S. throws absolute cold water on this, saying that there's no time frame. You know, something might get done. Something might not get done. Uh, we're, we're close to an agreement where we're not that close. And so the U S really never seems to, uh, uh, throw our, you know, give to any idea that we actually might be close, getting closer to getting a deal done. Now, some of this may be like political strategy on the Biden administration's behalf in the United States. Uh, the, the, like more we say, oh, we're getting closer to the deal. The more the Israel lobby, the Republicans are going to be up in arms about getting closer to a deal. However, this is an easy debate for the Biden administration to win. And so they really should want to have it with the Republicans. After that, I believe June 18th or 19th, we have, uh, Iranian cleric Ibrahim Rossi, 
uh, Arizi being elected as the Iranian president. He was a hardline candidate. And so essentially at this point, the Biden administration has now created a position where it either doesn't return to the JCPOA or it returns to the JCPOA, but only after the Iranian hardliner has been taken uh, presidency in Iran, which kind of will give him the, the political victory in Iran for returning to the agreement, which will help the Iranian economy. It'll be beneficial for Iran. That's why, you know, even after the U.S. has been so negligent and such an unfaithful and bad stabbing negotiation partner, they're willing to try to, you know, get something done with the U.S. because the U.S. is the world empire. And if you want to have more prosperity in your country, you have to at least not be uh, on the receiving end of the wrath of the world empire. And so the, this hardline candidate winning seems to be a real political loss and blunder for the Biden administration. They had these six months to return to the deal and waiting all this time essentially guaranteed that, you know, it's a worse situation than entering in uh, when the moderate was in charge. We also had the U.S. seizing uh, 33 domain names that it allied with Iran. Now, some of these were like Houthi groups, so who knows how actually much this had to do with the Iranian state or how much Iran cares at all. But the uh, English domain name for Press TV was seized by the the Justice Department as well as, uh, again, a bunch of other websites. Uh, a very provocative thing to do when you're, again, pretending to negotiate with this country. The U.S. bombed Shia militias in Iraq and Syria at the end of the administration. And while on the show, I've made the point that, look, the, these militias are not as tied to Iran as the Biden administration likes to pretend that they are. The Biden administration says that bombing these militias sends a message to Iran. And so that is definitely a clear message that Iran will receive, that the Biden administration wants uh, Iranian bad forces to be on the receiving end of our bombs. So... Iran then, uh, June 27th here, announced that it will no longer cooperate with the IAEA on the monitoring deal. I still don't know all the details of what Iran, if they're still collecting this data, if they would be willing to return it, turn it over to the IAEA should the U.S. return to the agreement. But the U.S., again, big blunder, could have gotten back into the agreement. IAEA would have had this data. That data would have allowed them to ensure that Iran complied with the nuclear deal or, you know, was doing what they were doing out of compliance with the nuclear deal. Uh, said that, you know, they were doing like publicly now say we're enriching uranium up to 20 percent. The IEA could essentially, I guess, verify that with this data. But now that can happen or maybe couldn't happen uh, again because the U.S. drug its feet for so long. And I believe Iran uh extended this for one month if not two so we're well past the february date when they said they would, would stop engaging in these additional inspections that are a part of the jcpoa which again iran is no longer benefiting from because the u.s left it throughout the talks uh there has been maybe like a side issue being discussed in Vienna, at least according to the Iranians. And that would be for a prisoner swap where the U S where any American prisoners in or Iran would be released in exchange. The U S will release all Iranian, uh, prisoners uh in the u.s that were there because of sanctions violations i think is what iran was going for again look the the big issue is the nuclear deal this is a smaller issue it wouldn't be a giant deal if the biden administration did it however it would be the kind of thing that you know that you could build on diplomacy you can make this uh you know happen uh the the nuclear deal happen maybe if you start with smaller things like prisoner swaps but the biden administration doesn't even really respond to this and in fact we now learn on july 19th that the biden administration according to the wall street journal is thinking of new sanctions against iran's oil sector to target their shipping to china and so this would uh, just, again, be further steps down the Trump administration's path. And statements out this week from the Biden administration really sound like they've almost completely given up on negotiations. Uh, the U.S. has warned that 
uh, Iran's incoming government that there will not be a better deal than what's currently uh, on the table. And apparently what is currently on the table has uh, some poison pills in it, including calls uh, for Iran to engage in further negotiations uh, with the U.S. and And the Biden administration is refusing to commit uh, from leaving the agreement again, which is another issue for the Iranians. And so then we also have uh, the Secretary of State saying that uh, the Iran negotiating process cannot go on indefinitely. I'm not exactly sure why. It's not like the U.S. Is, needs to start a war with Iran tomorrow or Iran is like getting any kind of benefit with the status quo. They need the sanctions relief. It's not like more sanctions would be applied to Iran uh, or should be applied to Iran, I guess, if they don't go along with this negotiation. Maybe that's what the U.S. is thinking, though, that if Iran doesn't go along, they're going to turn up the pressure even more to try to give a better deal. Anyways, uh, that's basically what I want to go over on the Iran issue to really get into and break down this issue and explain how the Biden administration botched, botched an excellent uh, idea to re return to the deal, how he's empowered the hardliners in Iran with his negotiating strategy, where he's constantly shown a willing Iranian negotiating partner that the U.S. is unwilling and an untrustworthy negotiating partner. Before I wrap up today, I do want to talk about some other things going on in the Middle East. We have uh, a change to the U.S. troop roles in Iraq, at least. At least that's uh, what's coming out on paper. On Monday, President Biden and Iraqi President, our Prime Minister, excuse me, uh, Karami, agreed that the U.S. Uh, combat mission in Iraq will be over by the end of the year, but U.S. troops would have remained in the country in an advisory role. I I don't see any difference here. If you have troops in Iraq, you have troops in Iraq. Maybe there's some kind of agreement here where they're going to leave the bases left off there or something like that. So there could be less uh, chances that a U.S. soldier could get killed in Iraq, which would be good. Uh, you know, less running in conflict with the Shia militias. But at the same time, the U.S. troops, 2,500 of them, will remain targets in Iraq for any number of groups or people in the Middle East who will want to exact revenge on the U.S. from the, the decades of terror we've inflicted in that region. Now, somewhat surprising to me, uh, this from Jason Ditz at Antiwar.com, key Iraqi clerics are endorsing the move and are welcoming the pledge for the U.S. to end their combat role. I thought the uh, Iraqi Shia militias would see it largely as the American media is portraying this as being simply, a, you know, a piece of paper, worthless statement, uh, something to, you know, maybe uh, the Iraqi uh, Prime Minister could go and wave around and say, hey, I got this from the Americans, but isn't any real commitment to do anything. Uh, but at the same time, we did have some uh, positive statements from some clerics. That being said, we also had uh, this today, rockets hit inside a ROTS green zone. Uh, there were only two rockets, no casualties were reported, so this isn't necessarily the biggest deal. But if rockets are being fired into the green zone, it's potentially that this was Shia militias and that they were carrying this out uh, because, uh, uh, you know, being unhappy with American forces uh, still being in Iraq and, and you know, the, the change not being enough. The other issue uh, with the, the you know, change in the troops is that it's apparently not going to happen until the end of the year. And so there's a lot of times for things to change in Iraq uh, to change. Uh, what the U.S. role of troops will be in that country, including a coming election in October, or maybe not. This uh, Jason did at antiwar.com. Iraq's October election faces boycotts over corruption, security woes. Iraq is facing an important election in October, but the legitimacy of that election could be in question with parties pulling out over concerns about the process. Iraq's Communist Party is the latest to pull out, and while not a huge deal, uh, a huge party. They did win 13 seats in the last election, uh, but the bloc of Motada al Sadr, which won 54 seats in the last election, is the biggest of any party uh, to pull out. And so, it, you know, if more people pull out, the election is going to be seen as illegitimate. That'll likely only exacerbate a rot's political chaos.
We had drones hit, or at least according to Iraqi paramilitary, this is one of the popular mobilization forces, a Shia military uh, uh, militia in Iraq, uh, says that it was targeted with drones at one of its ammunition stores. No reports of casualties or if anybody died. Uh, not clear on who carried out this attack, but the, these are the kind of attacks that have led to escalation cycles in the past in Iraq. Let's talk about Syria now, where unlike Iraq, where Biden is at least willing to talk about the U.S. troop presence and maybe changing it. In Syria, the Biden administration says they had no plans to pull troops out of Syria. They There are currently about 900 troops in northeastern Syria. This is uh, the part of Syria that borders Iraq. And uh, the, these troops are aiding uh, the Kurdish, uh, the Syrian Democrat forces, and their control of that territory, which includes some Arab lands, uh, some places they're fighting against ISIS. I believe the U.S. actually carried out an airstrike on behalf of those Kurdish forces uh, earlier this week. The U.S. is uh, not only keeping up their occupation of uh, uh, Syria, excuse me, but they are also imposing sanctions on the Syrian government. Uh, these sanctions are a part of the Caesar ad saying that um, they are sanctioning, I think, eight Syrian prisons and five Syrian officials uh, for what was exposed uh, through the Caesar uh, trove of photographs. Now, there's a lot of problems with these Caesar documents. Not all of them were seen. A lot of the people that were dead in the photo uh, were not actually victims of the Syrian government, not necess not dreadfully at least, but rather were Syrian army soldiers fighting on behalf of the Syrian government that had been killed. Uh, not quite exactly sure if the that you know, the, how targeted, how good these sanctions are. I'm sure there are horrific things that go on in Syrian government prisons. I wouldn't want to be in a Syrian government prison. That being said, there's horrific things also going on and very well documented in the camps run by the U.S. and our Kurdish allies in northeastern Syria. But, you know, the, the Syrian prisons, I, I'm sure, are terrible. And uh, so, you know, maybe the five you know officials that were sanctioned uh, were actually, you know, torturers or who did horrible things to the prisoners living there. I, I don't know uh, about that, but, you know, the sanctions against the Assad government is going to exacerbate our tensions and kind of continues the Obama-Trump uh, policy of C uh, Assad must go in Syria. We also have the U.S. sanctioning uh, a couple other people in Syria, but these don't seem to be uh, uh, Assad targets, but rather uh, rebel groups. And one was uh, Ahare al-Shariki. Uh, and I probably just absolutely butchered the name of that militant group, but is apparently a rebel group to Assad, and then two of the leaders of that group were sanctioned along with the group itself. So that's what's happening uh, in Syria, along with Israel bombing. Now, Russia is apparently looking to curtail this. Syria has been bombing, or Israel, excuse me, has been bombing Syria at least every other week for years on end now, with the most recent strikes being targeted outside Aleppo in the Homs region of Syria. Uh, they always say that they're targeting Iranian targets. You know, it's really hard being in the United States to actually nail down what and who is being targeted here, but I'm sure it's absolutely terrifying for the people of Syria, and sometimes civilians do die in these strikes. And Russia says that, that you know they finally had enough of this, and they're going to look to upgrade Israel's, or excuse me, Syria's uh, missile defense systems uh, to help them to uh, prevent these Israeli attacks. Along with bombing Syria, Israel recently also bombed North Lebanon overnight. And one of the reasons I mention this is because the U.S. is constantly uh, warning that, oh my God, Iran is the most destabilizing actor in the region. Well, it's actually Israel that bombed recently Syria, Lebanon, and within Gaza, you know, its own territory under its own control. Uh, it seems to be a lot bigger problem in the Middle East. And that's one of the reasons Ben and Jerry. Uh, a company decided to stop selling their ice cream in the occupied regions of the West Bank. 
And while the owners of Ben and Jerry's are no longer Ben and Jerry, Ben and Jerry published an op-ed in the New York Times uh, endorsing the, the move by the, their, uh, you know, the company that they formed uh, that, you know, has now been bought by a different company. But uh, Ben and Jerry's, I still believe, is based in Vermont. Again, uh, as I note, the last time I talked about this story, Antiwar.com, who I work for, has received donations in the past from Ben Cohen, one of the, the founders of Ben and Jerry's, and you know, just want to make that known. Although that I, you know, that, that in no way affects my analysis on the issue. You know, I, I said that the, in a way, this really isn't a big deal. We're just talking about sell, not selling one brand of ice cream to a few hundred thousand people who live in, you know, the occupied territories of the West Bank. I'm not even sure if people in that region really like Ben and Jerry's or not. However, Ben and Jerry, uh, I believe, are both Jewish. And so maybe it was a popular ice cream car. I mean, people like Ben and Jerry's, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry are Jewish. Maybe they did have a large uh, standing in the West Bank or something like that. But at the same time, you know, there's a hundred, uh, not a hundred, but there's dozens of companies that make really good ice cream. Uh, Blue Bunny, f f absolutely fantastic. So why the, the people of the West Bank are so upset and, re you know, really care? It seems like they, they could should, should kind of just have, well, you know, you're going to have less money now. You're going to sell less ice cream. Such to be you, Ben and Jerry's. But instead, the response by Israel has been to literally, or at least by their own quotations, launch a maximum pressure campaign against Ben and Jerry's. And so it's blowing this whole thing up into a giant ice cream war, and Israel's going to be the one that loses most from this. At the end of the day, it's very obvious what Israel is doing are human rights abuses. People just saw the bombing of Gaza, the, the public opinion polling is changing. I mean, this is a statement from Israel. They say that their soldiers in the West Bank shot a Palestinian because he had Approach troops with the iron bar in his hand. Well, that sounds to me like as much of an execution as, as you know, uh, some kind of police force. And so I don't think this maximum pressure campaign and making a big deal out of this is going to help Israel. And so while I initially thought that this might not be a big deal, I think this is actually going to be a very big deal. And that because people like Ben and Jerry's, because they're seen as in the United States, they have a reputation as like a humanitarian kind of hippie ish people. Uh, the, the, you know, the company, uh, I always see ads about like, you know, they don't pay their CEO at times more than, you know, their janitors and stuff like that. And so, you know, to try to slander a, a, con a company that has such a progressive reputation and Jewish leadership or, you know, Jewish founders as being anti-Semitic is going to be a, a stretch. And it's, I think, going to be a real blow to Israel's anti-boycott, divestment and sanctions narrative. And and, uh, you, you know, while, again, additionally, initially, I didn't think this would be a huge idea. Uh, this could be uh, another changing point in the at least the American discourse around Israel. So, the, you know, the, the ice cream wars uh, could be a bigger deal uh, than I had initially uh, thought. But uh, I'll continue to look at and follow that story, especially as Israel's maximum pressure campaign is maybe not netting like any real victories for their PR, but uh, at least against Ben and Jerry's or their parent company in states like Florida, Texas, and New York, which are looking to divest uh, again from Ben and Jerry's and his parent company. All right. That's the show uh, for the week, everybody. I hope you enjoy it. We got some great stuff coming up next week. I'm really excited uh, about some of the episodes I, I have uh, planned. I had to do some rearranging, and so the, the planned uh, interview I have for today got delayed, but it will be out next week, and I, like I said, you guys are absolutely going to love it. So make sure you subscribe to the show somewhere. That way you don't miss the show. Uh, YouTube, Odyssey, Rumble for audio or video versions. Audio's up anywhere you can listen to podcasts. Libertarian Institute is where the show is hosted. So libertarianinstitute.org for a full archive of my work that I put out as the news editor of the Libertarian Institute. And that includes the daily news roundup that I write every day. 
um, social media accounts, Facebook, MeWe, and Twitter. Donate to the show if you can. Me and Will are putting in a lot of work to put out some, you know, great products. Uh, the, but the more, you know, we're, we're getting financially from the show, the more we could put into it, also including investing more money into the show. So the links to subscribe star, uh, Patreon, and Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash are in the show notes everywhere. Uh, so think about giving to the show if you can. And I, I really appreciate everybody for tuning in. Be back with more stuff next week.